This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cattles. This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cattles. Let's talk about this game coming up on Sunday, Greg. We're talking Browns. We're talking Patriots in Cleveland. I will tell you right off the bat, not going to make my pick yet, but this is all week long. This has been the toughest game for me to figure out where I want to go with it and and who I'm going to pick. We'll get to the pick later, but Mm -hmm. it's a pretty difficult pick. And I think uh, you might agree with me on that, or maybe not. Maybe you think I'm crazy and you've got this was as an easy one, but let's start with some headlines. Uh, Mac Jones update on good old Mac. Will he be back this week, Greg? So we saw him in practice, uh, yesterday. So today's Thursday. We haven't yet seen him today. Um, he was officially limited in practice. We saw some video of him definitely improved from a week ago, uh, moving around a little bit better. Uh, I still think he's at least a week away. I, I just don't think there is the, the big thing coming back from a, whether it's a broken ankle or severe ankle sprain is the strength in the ankle. Um, you know, I think Mike Giardi had a report that he talked about, like the the stability isn't quite there, and but the swelling has gone down. That's if you've ever sprained your ankle really bad, this is how it goes for a couple of weeks. You know, they actually have you walk on it and do things to keep the strength up, and it all depends on when you start gaining strength to gain that stability in the ankle. Because if you go out there, but I mean, you could tape it up and you know as much as you can and and. You might be able to get through some games, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, he's going to need strength in that ankle to, you know, absorb hits and things like that. So I don't totally rule him out for this week. I, I'm sure Max trying like hell. David Andrews said that yesterday. They they know that he's trying like hell to get back. Um, I, I just think this is a bit too early and considering I think the Bears are next on the schedule. And they're awful. Uh, you know, I would keep them out the next two weeks and really focus on the Jets game if if I were running the Patriots. But, of course, I'm not. I'm with you 100%. When I hear instability with the ankle and, you know, they might be able to coach around it or might be able to do some things to help him or – no. No, again, there's no reason to rush him. If If he's got some instability in the ankle, let's not make things worse. Let's – be cautious with him. As I said last week, I don't think you bring him back uh, against the Browns this weekend. Uh, apparently, Greg, you have been called a hater. Shocker, right? Shocker. <laughs> Greg Bedard is called a hater, but Dodd's just a hater. Uh, you're being called a hater because of uh, your, your opinions on Zappy. How dare you try to break the fever of Bailey Zappy? But you have an outside opinion, Greg. You, you want to defend yourself and say, hey, I'm not the only guy in this world that sees things the way I see them with Bailey Zappi. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I'm, uh, you know, on record, I did a deep dive on his first start at BSJ broke down his good plays. What I really liked broke down some of the plays that I didn't like. And, you know, at the end of the day, I thought he was, you know, solid, did his job, you know, credit to him. That's great, but uh, not a high degree of difficulty. Um, I still see him as sort of a backup. Uh, that's that's where I I see his his you know sort of his height of his career is you know really good backup that you really like having around and and I will say Nick I don't think we talked about this on the podcast I think I mentioned it on Felger and Maz I think what's really good about Zappy and credit to the Patriots scouts and and you know Joe Judge for getting him ready into this point but I think. You know, now that Zappy has shown you that you can throw him in an emergency situation as a rookie and, you know, lead two scoring drives in Green Bay and, and you know, do what you need to do, manage the game in his first career start, you know, he now gives you some comfort that you have uh, a good, solid backup option. And to me, I think the, the thing that now Bailey, maybe it's not this year, because, you know, both Mac Jones and Zappi are really young. So I think Brian Hoyer is needed around there for his institutional knowledge. Uh, I think that, you know, beyond this year, he displaces Brian Hoyer and it gives you a chance to maybe take some swings in the middle rounds on, 
you know, sort of like a tradey quarterback, you know, uh, a really mobile guy, somebody with a big arm, somebody who, you know, maybe doesn't check all your boxes, but maybe with two or three years of development could be, I mean, look at, you know, like a Dak Prescott who was taken in the middle rounds, um, Russell Wilson, that you're looking for that type of guy that you can maybe put a future bet on, bring him in house. And you know, you have Mac Jones, you know, you have Bailey Zappi and you can let this guy develop and who knows, maybe he hits big in two or three years. So I think that's exciting. But, you know, Greg Cosell, who's I've had on the podcast, a guy that I respect his opinion enormously on Russ Tucker's football podcast, they talked about Bailey Zappi and I thought we should share that with the people. Well, that's uh, now he starts for the Patriots. What did you see? The Patriots obviously take on Cleveland, but I'm most interested in what you saw from Bailey Zappi and the Patriots offense. And I think that Zappi is what people thought he was coming out. He knows where to go with the ball within the timing and structure of the route concepts and combinations. He's decisive with his reads and throws. He's, he always knows where his receivers are relative to the defensive coverage. Um, his delivery is quick. It's compact. There's no wasted motion. Um, the issue with Zappi is his lack of NFL arm strength. That's, that is a meaningful limitation. Now, everybody talks differently about what arm strength means, and there are a lot of people who say arm strength is overrated. Arm strength is overrated until you need to make an arm strength throw. Then it's not overrated. Um <laughs> What I will say about Zappi is this. In this particular game against the Lions defense and the way the game played out, he did not really have to make any contested throws at all. And that's the kind of thing you would need to see because he's not a big guy. Um, and you, you did not see him under duress at all. He did not have to operate in muddy pockets. That's the next test. Now, obviously, he's not going to be the Patriots starter. So, who knows what happens? I'm sure he will go this week based on what I know about Mac Jones's injury. And we'll see how not only he, but how the Patriots handle the fact that they're going to play Miles Garrett and, and, you know, Clowney and some better pass rushers than the Lions brought to the table a week ago. So we'll see how he handles that and how the game plays out. Uh, but there was no question in this given game against Detroit, he was really never under duress. So you did not see him have to deal in those in that kind of environment. I think Greg rests his case. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think that's I think that's fair. You know, I think, uh, you know, and I'm to go ahead and talk for a second while I'm trying to figure out how to. Oh, OK. I just paused it. Um I think that's I think that's fair. I mean, I think that hits the nail on the head. I mean, it's not hating on Zappy and and who knows, maybe he shows more when uh, when he gets put in that circumstance. And, and you know, will he be put in that circumstance this week? You know, we're going to talk about the Browns um, and, and this matchup. But, uh, you know, I think that's fair. I think he has. He has limitations. They Ross and and Greg went on to discuss, you know, sort of, uh, you know, comparisons for him. And it's, you know, it's it's the backup Tice. I said Chase Daniel, uh, who's been a career backup, um, who I think has a little bit better arm than Bailey Zappi. Um, but they mentioned a couple other names. And definitely, if you want to see that, I would check it out. But, yeah, I think that's I think the way they talked about it, I think that's that's extremely fair. And I, I don't see why anybody would really argue with that. Simple reads, clean pocket, run game. Pretty much, that's what it comes down to. And he had all three of those things working last weekend against the Lions. Let's look forward to this weekend, the Cleveland Browns. And, you know, when you look at this defense, Greg, of Cleveland, especially their run game defense, they are awful against the run. I mean, putrid against the run. So it begs the question, will Zappi even have to throw the football more than, say, 10, 12, 15 times? He shouldn't have to. He really shouldn't. I mean, Nick, this is and, you know, sometimes we talk in hyperbole and I really try to avoid that. But, you know, when when I say things, I'm, you know, I, I'm trying to be as straight as possible. I, I can't remember a worse run defense, interior defensive line and plus the linebackers. They just traded for Deion Jones, but it's completely pointless. This interior defensive line is the lightest and most movable unit I've ever seen. When you see them on the field, you're like, wait a minute, why are they in sub right now? And then you look at their <laughs> personnel and you're like, no, this is the best they have. 
Like it, it is a, it is so the, the, uh, who'd they play the chargers and they ran all over them and the chargers don't even have a good offensive line. Austin and Edward last weekend. He did. And and these guys in the middle of the line just get moved all over the place. Like the Patriots should run for over 200 yards easily in this game. If not 300, you could bust out the Buffalo Bills win, you know, uh, Mac Jones, three pass attempts in this game. And the Patriots could probably win going away. I mean, that's how bad they are now. You know, uh, you know, I will say you do. You just don't want to be stupid. You don't want penalties. You don't want, you know, all of a sudden blown assignments and you're into long yardage and now you got to pass because then that plays into a little bit. You know, they're basically the you, you look at the Browns and we know a little bit what we know about them is that they're money ball constructed, deep Podesta and all those guys. And like it basically looks like their plan is, uh, you know, when you consider Deshaun Watson, as the, the the quarterback of this team, because then, you know, you're talking about a really hell of an offense. You're just talking about like, we want to construct a defense that's just going to make a few big plays a game, a few turnovers, get a holding call, something like that. And now we get the ball back to our offense because it is, you know, the Patriots are constructed to win in any sort of situation. And, you know, you may knock on them for not having enough talent. Like Jelani Tavai is great for the Patriots because he can do a lot of things. Now, is he talented? No. And should he start in play in a lot of places? No, but the Patriots want to have the flexibility. So he has value to them. Whereas the Browns are just like, yeah, we only care about like getting into track meets and hopefully getting a few holding calls or sacks. And that's enough, a few turnovers. And that's how we're going to play defense because they're, they're horrendous. On the interior and the and the DVOA from Football Outsiders, which takes out opponents and 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 really sort of levels the playing field, they are by far the worst run defense in the league. And guess who's right above them? The Lions, who the Patriots just ran over, and the Packers, who the who the Patriots just just ran over. And so uh, this is a this is now what, what's that? Three weeks in a row that they are facing the dregs of the NFL in terms of run defense. And I see them this playing right into the Patriots and, and they should be able to steamroll these guys up front. Steamroll them up front. And of course, don't forget Damian Harris is going to be out of this game. The reports are he'll probably be out a, a couple of weeks. So, you know, that, that kind of makes it interesting. How much is Ramondre out there? I'd imagine he'd get the vast majority of carries. They might mix it up a little bit with Kendrick Bourne. If John who comes back, he could get a couple of carries. They've got JJ Taylor and, and Pierre strong as options as well. So I'm interested to see who's active uh, at running back this weekend to, to kind of help alleviate some of the Ramondre Stevenson snaps and, and, and carries. We'll, we'll see how they put that all together. Yeah. Not, not that it's really going to matter. I mean, you know, you could run for probably a hundred yards uh, <laughs> against this interior, and like, you know, I would expect that Pierre Strong gets a few touches, but I, I would think that Kevin Harris on the practice squad, who was one of their draft picks, who did not pop in the in the preseason and got released and signed back to the practice squad, depending on what he's done at practice. I mean, he's really the other first two down running back that's on the entire roster, including the practice squad. So as long as he's doing the right things, he would be sort of a safe promotion. Like if Stevenson goes down, Harris has more of the body type quadzilla over there that can do the, you know, first two downs. But, uh, you know, these guys are so bad. It's not going to matter who they put back there. I'm not worried about it one bit. And, you know, one thing I wanted to mention, they traded for Deion Jones, who I love Falcons middle linebacker to, to add to this group. And he might play this week, but like, you talk about putting lipstick on a pig. I mean, what is the point of having a, a athletic, good middle linebacker when the offensive line is pushing the defensive interior five yards down the field and you're making tackles 15 yards down the field? That's really what the Browns defense is right now. Yeah, and Jones would be literally parachuting in. He hasn't played for the Falcons. He's been banged up yep. a lot last year or two. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about the Patriots being able to run with the second guy. I'm just more... Uh, interested in to see how Belichick handles the roster and who, and who does get the call up, whether it's Harris or it's strong. Um, when you look at that defense, really the, the only guy, I mean, look, Ward's pretty good on the outside at corner. 
but when you're talking about the front seven, you're talking about Miles Garrett and Jadavian Clowney. Clowney did not practice yesterday. Who knows if he's going to be a go? Garrett literally is lucky to be alive after a car accident going back a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was limited in practice, but Greg, you, you highlight one matchup this week, and that's big old Trent Brown, who we said earlier this week in the pod has been really good since the Miami game. He's been really, really good. Uh, if Garrett goes, which we anticipate he will, how do you look at that matchup between Brown and Garrett? Yeah, that's a phenomenal matchup. And, uh, you know, you wonder if if the Browns think about flipping Miles Garrett to the other side, um, you know, because Clowney's the other bookend, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, is he practicing this week? Is he healthy? Does he feel like playing this week? I mean, when he wants to play, you know, he's great. But his whole career has been up and down. But, you know, Miles Garrett, he he's sensational. He really is. Um he gets and I just saw a chart somebody put out Seth Walter or somebody put out some one of these x y access charts things and and basically it measured the two quadrants were pass rush pass rush win rate yep. say that five times fast and double team rate and Miles Garrett was way the hell out here like as he's a unicorn he gets double teamed all the time and he still gets he still gets pressure and he's the dynamite against the run as well I mean he is he is among the elite of edge rushers edge defenders in this league right now now that being said uh first of all I think Trent Brown can handle him second of all he's one of these run by the quarterbacks types that I'm sure Bailey Zappi is going to be under uh, strict instruction this week is like, look, just step up in the pocket and move up and either run or, or throw the ball. Like he just, he did well last week. Um, Aiden Hutchinson was sort of good practice for that. Cause Hutchinson's another run by the quarterback type of guy. And I know the Patriots will have a tremendous plan for miles Garrett and they'll, they'll be out there. They'll say, we're not going to let him beat us. Cause really He's the only guy in the defense. Yes, Clowney can make a play once in a while. Ward has played awful this year, even though he looks at times, he looks tremendous on film. Um, you know, other than that, they're very undersized at linebacker. Uh, not really. And we talked about the defensive interior. Uh, there's not much on this Browns defense other than Garrett. And so you just got to take care of him. And I'm sure the Patriots will have a tremendous plan for it. Let's talk uh, Patriots schedule now on both sides of the football. Offensively, uh, they have faced pretty much the, the easiest offensive schedule in the league. And, and Greg, when you look forward here over the next several weeks, it doesn't look like it's going to get too much tougher. No, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I mentioned uh, Felger and Maz this week, and I think even somebody called in. He's like, but I doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, the, the Ravens are good now on defense and stuff like that. See, this is not, this is not my opinion. This is out of advanced analytics. And it, what it does is it takes out, you know, it takes every play and runs it against league average and, and takes all sorts of conditions. And so it's, it's not, a, I'm not saying it's a perfect tool and I don't, you know, I, I don't live my life by DVOA over at football outsiders, but it's a good blunt tool to look at. And, you know, they have by far played against the easiest offensive schedule to date. Uh, and, you know, that's only going to extend. I mean, the, this Browns defense is, is horrible. And, you know, the, I haven't looked at the Bears and any other teams, but I assume this is going to go on for a while. And, you know, and it goes into the whole, we'll see in the last six or seven games where this Patriots team is, how good they are. Um, but, you know, you also have to look at the, the other side of the coin, which we need to point out, is that the Patriots defense has gone against the hardest schedule uh, for NFL defenses. So that's something for them to hang their hat on. And I do think that they are going to be challenged this week by this Browns offense. I agree with you. And, you know, when you look at the Patriots defense, I said this in the podcast earlier this week, I actually feel pretty good about them if they can deal with some of these run leaks. And uh, I think that will lead us in a little bit to this matchup specifically and, and how Cleveland could give them some headaches. But just to kind of highlight a couple of things here with the Pats offensive schedule and how it looks against this Browns defense, that the Browns are good on third down. They've been pretty good on third down this year, defensively and offensively. So, you know, if they do get Bailey Zappi into some third and longs, it, it could be somewhat of an issue for the quarterback. They're not great in the red zone, which we know the Patriots have had their own red zone issues. This might be a, a get good game, so to speak, in the red area if you get down there 
Can you finish those drives like you were unable to against Detroit? And, you know, defensively, front seven, right, stop the run. Uh, when you look at Cleveland, they're just an elite run team, you know, f- number five in yards per game, but number one in yards per carry. Uh, they rip chunks. They rip chunks off the field in the run game, Greg, which leads me to the offensive line, because I know you as an offensive line guy, you're watching this Browns offensive line. And I can tell you the numbers. I'll get to them in a little bit. But, Greg, tell the people how good this old line is in Cleveland. This offensive line is spectacular. It's the best I've seen on film this year by far. It starts with the two guards, uh, Petonio at left guard, Wyatt Teller at right guard. Uh, they just completely control the game. They, they, are, they, they always play within themselves. They don't get overwhelmed by anything. Um, you know, I, I, right tackle uh, Conklin, you know, former Tennessee Titan, really good player, power blocker. Uh, I don't love the left tackle, Jedrick Wills, um, even though, you know, I, I saw him deal with some stuff last week against the Chargers, you know, Khalil Mack and stuff like that, where I think he did he did a pretty good job. He's, he's definitely improved. I would say the weak spot is at center, Ethan Posick, uh, former Seahawk. Um, not the most athletic guy, but he's graded out really well. He's fourth among centers uh, by PFF. But Batonio's third. Teller's second among guards, Conklin's 23rd, and Wills is 42nd uh, at their respective positions. Um, you know, they're just, they're they're unbelievable up front. So this is a really good test to see how the Patriots run defense. And of course, Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt are one of the best running back tandems in the league. And so, you know, if you wanted to see the Patriots run defense get tested, um, this is it. And, you know, this is, and then, you know, you mix in what they do with the passing game. Uh, you know, I think Jacoby Brissett is a good, solid backup. Um, his strengths are, he does have a strong arm. He's mobile. Uh, you know, I do think he's a bit, he, he's going to throw you the ball a few times yeah. and, and he likes to throw these. They love to throw these outs. I can see Jack Jones getting his third pick, maybe another pick six in this game but you know my my main thing watching the browns offense is considering how good they are running the ball with this offensive line and chubb they don't build a lot off of it their pass game their their play action game is really weak they do it sometimes they don't do it nearly enough that i as i would do it and you know it just leaves you wanting more uh but you just think about this offense like you put deshaun watson in at quarterback yeah. with this offense whew, Look at, I mean, they're not great at receiver, and Joku's really good at tight end, has really improved. But um, Peoples Jones is their best receiver. I've never been an Amari Cooper guy. I'm still not an Amari Cooper guy, but you got to respect the talent. Yeah, it just that Jerry Jones trade for Amari Cooper is still one of the uh, funniest ones that I've covered as a as a radio talk show host. I <laughs> I hated that trade with every fiber of my being for the Cowboys. Uh, yeah, the Browns O line. I mean, number one in pass block win rate. They're pretty much middle of the pack and and run block win rate, which is pretty interesting and surprising. But I think that goes to what you're saying about Nick Chubb. Chubb's spectacular. The dude is ridiculous. And of course, Patriots fans out there upset that, you know, he could have been Um, Belichick versus Brissett could absolutely play a gigantic role in this game. He knows Brissett pretty well. And as you said, Brissett could turn the football over. And if you have one or two turnovers with this Browns team, I, I think you're you're pretty much steak dinner at that point. Uh, before we get to uh, some NFL talk, some quick around the league stuff, and of course our game pick, Greg, let's uh, tell the people about Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens because I wanted to make sure I was getting all the vitamins and nutritional supplements I needed in one place. I was sick of buying a bunch of pill bottles. Now I've been on it for three plus months and I love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy, even though it's a green juice. A lot of people are like, Bleh. but I'm telling you this tastes good it has a mild tropical taste, a little bit minty. And I actually look forward to it each morning. So what is this stuff with one delicious scoop of AG one, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics and adaptogens to help you start your day. Right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All the things you're looking for. I take it first thing in the morning. It's now part of my routine, and I'd be lost without it. I love how it contains less than one gram of sugar, so it helps 
Helps you watch your waistline. No GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills, supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is going to be huge during the wintertime here in New England, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Bedard. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Bedard to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. A couple of NFL stories that we want to get into. Seth Wickersham. Uh, I know a lot of Patriots fans do not like Seth Wickersham because of the story he wrote years ago. Uh, that Seth was highly is accurate. <laughs> Seth, is, Seth is considered one of the best in the business. Uh, mm-hmm. And he wrote... He wrote about Dan Snyder and a big story today, ESPN.com. And the, the, the one piece of this story that a lot of people are picking up on is this idea that Dan Snyder believes he's pretty safe because he has all sorts of dirt on NFL owners. And, and Jerry Jones is brought up in the story. Uh, Roger Goodell is, is brought up in the story. Uh, so first your thoughts about the Dan Snyder story by Seth Wickersham and, and also could Robert Kraft be one of those owners that Snyder has a little file on hidden somewhere in his office, Greg? So, uh, first of all, credit to Seth, Don Van Natta, the whole team that worked on this story. It's a tremendous story. Um, I also want to give credit to ESPN for, you know, in this day of uh, media contraction and all that, which I certainly uh, know as well as anybody, um, You know, it's very rare that uh, an outlet gives people just an opportunity to to put in the time to produce a story like this. I mean, you know, a lot of places are like, oh, you got to blog this, you got to do this. Well, you know, but, you know, if you really want really good, thorough investigative stories, you got to give these people the freedom and the time to do it. And I credit ESPN uh, for doing that. This is a tremendous story. I don't think anything is all that surprising in it. Um, I think it's, it's, it's really good confirmation of what we all suspected that, uh, you know, Dan Snyder is pro- the worst of the worst among NFL owners, um, that the pay, that the NFL made a terrible mistake getting in business with this guy when he was so young, I think he was 34 at the time. Um, That was a bad decision. And now they're stuck with it. And now they're just trying to find a way out of this. Um, You know, that that Snyder is treating this like, you know, you just looked at all the things that have been going on. You're like, what is the deal? How come they haven't gotten rid of this guy? And now, you know, I mean, it's it's made very clear in there that Dan Snyder is basically gone with the approach of mutually assured destruction that if you're coming after me i'm burning the house down with me so if you want to do that fine but i'm taking you all down with me and i i think you know that's a good strategy for snyder because you're talking about guys uh, largely um powerful rich white men who uh, you know, only at this point, especially Asian ones who only care about their legacy. And when you talk about, um, you know, Jerry Jones, I don't really think he cares at this point. Um, you know, what, what comes out, I mean, what else can come out about him? He's in the hall of fame. I think when you're talking, if you're Dan Snyder and you're trying to, um, insulate yourself, you know, you're getting dirt on the most powerful people. So that means, the most powerful owners and Goodell. So it's Goodell, it's Jerry Jones, it's Kraft. It's, you know, you're trying, you're trying to target the the most powerful people and also the people with the most to lose. And when you're talking about Goodell and Kraft, you're talking about two people who are consumed with their legacy right now. And like Goodell's looking at like, I could see him being like with the Snyder problem he wants it to pass it. He wants to pass it on to somebody else. Like he wants to get out of there, stay intact, have his hall of fame credentials. And I think Kraft's very much the same way where at this point, you know, he, he wants, he wants to be in the hall of fame. We saw the the push start this year. It's only going to grow in the years to come. And I think that Snyder's threat is very real for a lot of these guys. And that's a shame, but that's the reality of things. 
the Maras, the Roonies, they also have to be very uh, aware of what's going on. Those are some pretty yep. powerful ownership groups in New York and Pittsburgh, respectively. Yeah, I mean, this is what happens. And, and you know, owners are going to try to protect themselves. And that's why it's always difficult to get rid of an owner unless something is right there in black and white. And in this case, there's a lot of stuff in black and white. There's a lot of stuff that's been testified to. And it's it's pretty you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that Dan Snyder just stinks, uh, in a lot of, you know, in a lot of different ways, but these owners, they don't want their, like you said, legacies destroyed and they don't want the bad stuff to be leaked out either. So who knows if Kraft, you know, is involved and if there's a file on him and it, all you need is one or two owners who have power that get shook by this and they're not going to want to pull the trigger because they know they'll be in the crosshairs next. So, they're protecting themselves versus going after the guy that they should be getting out of the league. And that's just the way this thing works. Uh, Josh McDaniels. I don't know how many people watched Monday night. Hopefully a lot of people watched Monday night because you want to talk about a bananas football game. That mm -hmm. thing was entertaining as hell, but uh, the Raiders fall now to one and four on the season, Greg, just an update on them and, and an update on McDaniels. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just to let people know, I, I watch all the Raiders film every week just because, uh, you know, I want to see what what McDaniels is doing with his operation, what, especially I like watching that offense. And it's something I've always done in other places, like when people have gone on, whether it's, you know, Joe Philbin or uh, Ben McAdoo, like when I was covering the Packers, anybody who left the Packers, like I always, you know, keep tabs because I know these people and and, uh, you know, on my base, I want to see them you know, do well. And, but especially with McDaniels, they're on the schedule. I know the offensive system. It's good to compare that to what the Patriots are doing offensively. And, you know, so I've watched them the whole year and, and look, they're, I understand they're one in four. It's a bottom line business. Um, you know, what I'll say is <laughs> they've lost every game by one score. Um, it, things could easily be the other way and uh, that they're not, I'm sure is disappointing uh, to Josh. And I think, I think, you know, they just they, – they have to learn how to win. But, you know, in terms of – and especially, you know, that Chiefs game. Now, this is what I'll say about the Chiefs game. I don't think the – I don't think the Raiders played close to perfect in that game. I mean, you're talking about a Raiders team who traditionally, especially under Gruden, got the snot kicked out of them by the Raiders. And I thought that they had a really good plan. Uh, they obviously had some issues defending Kelsey in the red zone. Um which I found very unusual. <laughs> yeah. I mean, four touchdowns. I mean, he didn't do anything, but two, what he had four touchdowns and like 28 yards or something like that. Like it was just, so they did a great job between the tens. Um, but you know, outside of one, I got to say one of the plays and I, I think I'll put this on my Sunday column. One of the plays that they ran for Kelsey, I think it was his third touchdown. Just an unbelievable play design. I, I must have watched that play 25 times trying to figure out how the hell are you supposed to defend this? And I, I it's it, it was unbelievable, and I would steal that play tomorrow if I was an offensive coordinator. But a um, couple of things. I think that, you know, you can criticize McDaniels for the two-point decisions, some of the fourth down decisions. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, going into that game, if you're Josh McDaniels and the Raiders, you're like, we want to have the ball land uh, last with a chance to win with a field goal. Cause we have a great kicker in John Carlson at Arrowhead and, and that played out. Um, they just were one play short. I, I love the, I will say, I love the, the first fourth down decision to kick the field goal to go to three possessions. I thought that was good instead of going for it. The second one I did not love. I think it was fourth and two and they ended up kicking a field goal, which I think only it didn't give them three scores. It still stayed two scores. That's why I would have gone for it there. And the two pointer, I wouldn't have gone for it, but I didn't hate the decision because I think it played out exactly when you weigh the pluses and the minuses. If we go up, then this is going to happen. If we, even if we miss it, maybe the chiefs are a little bit more conservative. They're not on four downs. Maybe it's easy. And plus I got to say that Raiders defense was completely gassed. By the end of the fourth quarter, the Chiefs ran so many plays. They had those. The Chiefs gave them basically 10 points on stupid ass penalties uh, in that game. Yes, it evened out with the rough in the passer call. I understand that. But look, they're one in four. I still 
I still think they're a good team and they, they are about to go into a similar stretch as the Patriots where they could run off five, six wins in a row. And then it'll come down to the last six or seven games. And it's interesting that these two teams will face each other in December, because I think they're both going to be in the same ballpark. They're going to go on runs here and then we'll find out, are they really that good or not? So, it's interesting. I would say there are no moral victories. You've preached that to Patriots fans a lot. And, you know, one score games, here's what happens. Average to bad teams find ways to lose games. And that's what the Raiders are doing. We, we, can, we can talk about one possession games and we could say, oh, this play or that play, they've lost two 17-point leads, um, which is inexcusable to me. They lost one to the Cardinals and they lost one on Monday night. Um, as far as a two-point conversion, Decision, I agree with you on that. I would not have gone for it, but I, I don't necessarily hate the decision to go for it, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. The fourth down decision in the second quarter I thought was putrid uh, to, to try to go up. You know, you, you want to have a 17-point lead against Mahomes, that extra field goal. Like, I mean, you need to score touchdowns. It's a fourth and one. You're in, you're in Kansas City territory. I thought Josh had, an, he had a very kind of uneven message to his football team. At times in that game, he was uber aggressive. At times, he wasn't. What are you doing? Are you being aggressive against the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes, or are you not? And I thought not going for it on that fourth and one in the second quarter, you know, he had all the momentum. His team's up by two touchdowns. You could try to put your foot down on the throat of Mahomes. You kick a field goal. That makes him feel a little bit better. I just didn't. I I hated that. I also didn't like the fourth and one play call to end the game. The play action, take a shot down the field play. Didn't like it. I mean, you're, you're one or two yards away from a first down. All you need is a field goal. I don't like the shot play in that situation. So I thought that was a bad play call by Josh. So th- this team is finding ways to lose. And, you know, their schedule, absolutely, I agree with you, Greg, lightens up. And I do think they'll win some games in a row here. And I, I do think inevitably they will still be in the playoff chase. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, this, this front seven, Max Crosby is a beast. He's unbelievable. He's, yep. you know, Nick. Osa esque in up front Chandler Jones has come alive the last couple of games after being Finally. invisible. The first three. Mm-hmm. Um, the secondary I'm not in love with the tackling is not very good. And so, you know, this, this defense, if Crosby doesn't, you know, elevate his game week after week after week, they're going to give up a, a decent amount of points. And so I, I will give Josh credit in finding Josh Jacobs the last couple of weeks, which I, I have no idea why he wasn't utilizing him early portion of the season last two weeks they've given him the football a ton and this offense has been much better so we'll see how it all together though a couple Um, things on a couple things on that um you know the uh definitely fair criticism um absolutely uh i will say on the you know the the shots uh knowing mcdaniels and he talked about this in his press conferences but like everybody knows Spagnolo is bringing the house in those circumstances and the Patriots and, and the Patriots, the Raiders scored two touchdowns to Devonte Adams on similar plays early in the game going for it. Um, yeah. I understand they, you know, a lot of people are like, we'll just run the ball with Josh Jacobs. The chiefs are coming. You know, the run was not going to work. Those are the right play calls. Um, and plus with Devonte Adams, they just, you know, Renfro running into, uh, Adams was tough. And, and I will say, cause this is apt to the Patriots in our discussion about them. And, and it's fair to say about, you know, w- uh, I'm sort of, I'm sort of saying two different things where I'm saying, well, no moral victories for the Patriots, but you know, I'm talking about how it was a, a good close loss to the chiefs. Definitely fair. I just want you to explain my thinking behind that. And that's, you know, the Patriots, I just think the two teams are in two different places. I mean, we're talking about most of my criticisms of the Patriots go back to, you know, where were they at the end of last year offensively and, you know, their decisions, did they build on that or have they regressed? And, but really it's about, look, the Patriots have, they, they have similar coach. I mean, Bill Belichick's been here. The defensive coaches have been here for years. Yeah. It's different offensive coaches, but it's still largely the same system. So, you know, it's different than McDaniels is it, two new systems offensively and defensively. He's five games into his tenure. They're trying to build something where the Patriots should, you know, they were in the playoffs last year at 10 and seven with largely the same group. Yes. The Raiders were in the playoffs, but they've changed everything. So that's, 
I just think they're in two different places. If, if Josh McDaniels was in year two or three, then I would say something different, but they're trying to, I just see them as a different, they're in different points in, in terms of their programs. Some of that, certainly uh, Matt, Patricia and Joe judge the entire offensive staff is new. So I think they deserve some time. If we're going to give McDaniel some time, uh, especially seeing that Patricia and judge are doing these two jobs for the first time in their careers. So I would give them some time. Look, at, looking at both of these football teams, I would say, you know, defensively, like offensively, the Raiders are going to be, I think, really good if, if Waller can stay healthy. Their defense is not very good. Their third down defense in the second half was embarrassing. I mean, just in bad. They, they gave yeah, up but a third the, and eight. They gave up the a third Chiefs. and 15. They, they, I understand that, but it's a third and 15. You got to come up with a stop at some point. Um, and you can't let a team go six for six or seven for seven on third down. I'm not saying, you know, shut them down on third down, but they couldn't stop a third down until late in the game when they actually got the football back, which was the biggest stop that they had to have. So that's good. But they, they just let, you know, they let them just tear them apart on third down. And so I think offensively they'll get there. I think defensively they have issues again, Crosby and Chandler Jones will be fine, but I think defensively they've got some issues and, and as far as the shot plays, I'll push back on that too. You know, the, the touchdown to Devontae Adams against double coverage, that's like a third and 17 or something. And Derek Carr extends the play by moving up in the pocket and makes a tremendous throw. Yeah, you can take a shot play when it's third and long and you're pretty much like, okay, let's go for it. But a fourth and one, when all you need is a field goal, to me, that's not the same kind of situation or game or, or play call. Like when it's fourth and one, you need a field goal to win the game. You don't need to take a shot play downfield. Early in the game, third and long, take a shot play with your best receiver downfield. I get it. Not towards the end of the game. Browns by two and a half. Um, so as I said earlier, th this game's really tough for me because there's two ways this game can play out. The Patriots front seven shows up and they, they do a really good job of limiting the run. They put this in Brissett's hands. Brissett turns the football over once or twice. They don't have enough passing offense. The Patriots take advantage, run down their throats, and they win by like 10 to 14. The other, the other option on this is the Patriots front seven doesn't stop the run. And Nick mm -hmm. Chubb and Kareem Hunt run for a combined 2 250, and they slow the game down, and it's literally run game versus run game, possession for possession, and now you got a tight one. I'm going to go with the latter just because I, I don't – I need to see more from this – from this defensive front against the run for the Patriots to believe that they can limit a guy like Nick Chubb. So I'm going to go with the latter. I'm going to go with both run games look really good on Sunday. Both teams are capable of running the football and they do run the football and it's kind of a possession to possession game. I've got the Patriots winning. I've got it 23, 20, uh, pretty close game. Belichick over Stefanski, but uh, yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, this is, um, uh, I'm all about the Patriots this week. I am a huge Patriots honk this week. People are going to be like, what the hell is going on? What would you do with Bedard? I am all over the Patriots in this game. I think they kick the living crap out of the Browns. I think they'll, they will throw, they will throw everything they have at the running game. They're going to try to shut down Chubb and Kareem hunt. I think they will to a large extent. Chubb, Chubb will get his, but uh, I think that they are just fine making Jacoby Brissett beat them. Um, I, they will, after Chubb, they will take care of Ninjoku. Uh, Peoples Jones is a good receiver. I would leave, if I'm the Patriots, I'm leaving uh, the cornerbacks who I will say as a group, the collection, they have, even though we talked about it before the season where I thought one of the things, I thought the Patriots were going to be better at cornerbacks than a lot of people thought, even though it didn't look good early. But I think they have covered spectacularly in the back end. That's all of them, including Miles Bryant, who I thought just had a good game, a good bounce back game. Um, Jonathan Jones has done tremendous. Uh, you know, I think Mills was better af last week after coming back. Jack Jones has done a nice job. Um, I, I'm all about the Patriots in this game. I did a little parlay on the money line on the Patriots and the over in this game. Uh, I love the What's Patriots. The I, it is uh 43 and a half. So I, I think the Patriots could reach, they could actually reach into the thirties this week, but um, you know, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about 30 to 30 to 17 type of game. Um, if the, if the Browns even score that much, uh, but I just, I love the Patriots this week. This is the best I felt about them in, in a game all year. Wow. For yep. the first time we're, we're feeling out that I'm ready. 
medicine. Bedard's got the pom poms out. He's ready to yep. go. Um, so, but we both we both have the Patriots covering, so we both have the Patriots winning. I just have them winning a closer game. And if it's 43 and a half, I said a total of 43. Look, I'd bet the over. If it's a half a point, I'm, I'm going the over because I do think, you know, with Brissett and, and Bailey Zappi, you could have a turnover, which which really picks up the score. So uh, I would go Patriots over and Greg would go Patriots over. Uh, BSJ member question of the day, thirty nine ninety nine on the annual plan. Uh, check out all their great coverage. Greg, you've got a question for us this, this I do. Day. Pat's focus was coming hard at me in the comments section off of my breakdown uh, about Zappy. Pat's focus, I wonder who he roots for, uh, said, for all the heat and verbosity. How about that? Oh, verbosity. Hi, yeah, we have a high, high IQ over there at BSJ in the comments. How about some accountability to explain why the Patriots are the fourth best offense in the league per PFF? One cannot use the schedule as an excuse as it was the toughest part, something Green Bay. Couple that with not having their top quarterback for the first two games, blah, blah, blah. So he's saying, like, how about being accountable? Okay, here, the, since this is a pot, we love a couple times a year to talk about PFF. And so what you need to understand, Pat's focus, is Yes, the schedule does matter, and that's why you need to look at other tools like DVOA from football outsiders because it does take into account the opponent. And what PFF does, what you have to understand about their grade, it's not it's not a grade on, you know, that they're like, oh, the, the offense is, is the fourth best this year that we've seen. That's not what the grade is about. What the grade is is – they grade each individual player in terms of execution, and then they cobble that all together, and that's their grade for the game. So, uh, you know, and especially it's more slanted towards offensive lines. And so, uh, you know, I, I was going to look for something. But, like, for example, here are the other. The Browns are number one in PFF in offense. Um, they've played a weak schedule. The Eagles have played the 31st schedule. They're second. The Chiefs are the Chiefs, you know, and then the Patriots. So, so you know, yes, the Patriots are fourth. It's, it's basically an execution grade, and I would agree with that. I think, they've, I think they've executed reasonably well this year for the most part on offense, especially after the first week of the season where they had a lot of issues on the offensive line. Since then, the offensive line has been really good. But why? Because they're not playing good defenses. That's why. So you need to take that into account. Usually this evens out by the end of the year. Uh, but this, the PFF grade is exactly why you look at other tools. Because you have to take into account. To judge how good of an offense you really are, you have to say, well, how good is the competition? And so far, the Patriots competition has been the worst in the league. That will even out over the course of the season, largely. Uh, but that's my explanation on that. And that's me being accountable that that's the wrong number to grab on. In my opinion, verbosity means wordiness. If you're wondering verbosity means wordiness. Uh, so there you have it. There's our, our uh, podcast today. Thought it was a really good one. Getting ready for uh, Browns Patriots on Sunday. Of course, we'll be back next week to break that game down. Uh, Greg will tell you what he saw on the film should be uh, should be a lot of fun. Can the Patriots get to three and three? Can they get to 500? Both Greg and I think they will do that. We'll see if we're right or wrong. Uh, thanks to Athletic Greens. And until early next week, everybody have a great fun weekend. Be healthy, be safe, be good. It's the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cap.